Ryan, what's on your radar? So for a generation now, the story that journalists and political scientists have been telling about the arc of national politics dates back to the signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, when LBJ allegedly turned to an aide and said the party had just lost the, the South for a generation. And that story ends in our present era with a realignment that has sorted voters for the first time in American history into relatively coherent ideological camps, center left and left in one party and center right and right in the other. I've been a believer in that idea myself, but I'm starting to wonder how true it is. So let's walk the paces for a minute. By the South, of course, LBJ actually meant white people in the South. As Killer Mike said the other day, black people are always written out of our cultural understanding of the South, even though they built it. By the South, LBJ could also have been talking about rural white voters generally, including in the North and everywhere else, and he'd have been right. But even if that apocryphal quote is real, the truth was that this famous realignment in which black voters gradually and then more rapidly fled the party of Lincoln while white voters shifted from Democrat to Republican, it goes back much further. In 1892, one last attempt was made to enforce voting rights in Congress, but it was beaten back by a filibuster. And in his 1909 inaugural address, Republican William Howard Taft said, look, voting rights are a good thing that we ought to push for. But when we push for it, it just makes white people mad and we see more lynchings and more violence, so best not to do anything at all. So amidst a rising white terror campaign, the Great Migration began in the 1910s when millions of black families fled for cities in the North. Democratic machines there began courting their votes, building a fledgling alliance. In 1932, probably for the first time, though it's impossible to get firm numbers, a majority of black voters went Democratic, helping elect FDR president. This is more than 30 years before LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act. Now, for much of American history before the Depression, the Republicans, and before them the Whigs, and before them the Federalists, had been more a party of civil rights and women's rights than Democrats had been. Now, it was the 18th century, so it's obviously all relative, but there was a clear divide on that issue. For instance, the first time women were significantly involved in a presidential campaign was in 1840 on behalf of William Henry Harrison, organizing and speaking at Whig marches and otherwise doing legwork for the campaign. Democrats were appalled and thought it was outrageous what these liberals were doing. At the same time, though, it was the Democrats who were the party that was pro-immigrant, and it was the opposing party that was nativist, first anti-French, then anti-German, anti-Chinese, anti-Irish, anti-Italian, definitely anti-Catholic. John Fremont, in fact, in 1856, was the Republicans' first presidential candidate, and Democrats started a huge rumor that he was actually a secret Catholic, and it made a huge dent in his popularity. Here's some campaign lit put out to rebut it. Immigrant voters were so squarely in the Democratic camp that when Republicans after the Civil War amended the Constitution to allow formerly enslaved men to vote, they specifically left in some loopholes so that Republican states could throw up barriers to immigrant votes who they worried would vote Democratic. That particular story is told in the new book Republic of Wrath by James Monroe and is worth a read. In any event, as immigrants stuck with Democrats and FDR and black voters increasingly came Democrats' way, for the first time in history, the same party was becoming both pro-civil rights and pro-immigrant rights. And this was also the party of workers' rights, while Republicans were becoming solidly the party of big business and northern elites. Late in his term, FDR went to war with the Southern Democrats in the Senate, more evidence of the realignment coming far before LBJ. In 1941, he created the Fair Employment Practices Committee, which banned discrimination in the federal government and by any company doing war-related business, which was practically the entire economy. Southern whites lost their minds. Finally, in the 60s, this new coalition resulted in major civil rights legislation and immigration reform, which ballooned the number of immigrants over the next half century. Yet even as there were divisions on those issues between the parties, the lines were blurred. LBJ could never have gotten it through without the help of Republican leader Everett Dirksen, for instance, and many Southern Democrats voted against it, as the region as a whole began voting more heavily Republican the next generation. The 1994 Republican midterm wave put the finishing touches on the realignment, wiping out many of the remaining rural Democrats or seeing them switch parties. 
As the realignment continued to set in and the progressive wing rose in power, you wound up with a party that was diverse, socially liberal, economically progressive, and supportive of both civil rights and immigrant rights. On the right, Republicans were mostly homogenous, conservative socially, conservative economically, and skeptical of civil rights and immigrant rights. Yes, the business wing of the GOP still favored pretty loose immigration laws, but it was becoming clear that that wing was getting eclipsed. In other words, what it looked like was that the two-party system had finally sorted out ideologically rather than based on regional interests and awkward coalitions. I've made that argument myself, and it has profound implications, because if it's true, then it means that genuine change really is possible within the two-party system, and it also means politics becomes a zero-sum contest with extremely high stakes. But what if it's not true? What if that's all an illusion? After all, the system has worked so effectively to suppress any ability of those at the bottom to organize and express their demands for centuries. Why would it stop now? I want to return to that question in my next radar, but I've been thinking about this because on the one hand, the public's ability to influence public policy seems, be, seems to be pretty muted over the past decade. But at the same time, the House today or tomorrow is likely to pass a nearly $2 trillion spending bill with some $600 billion in climate investments and enough social spending to dramatically reduce poverty. That's on top of the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan from earlier this year, on top of the infrastructure bill that Biden just signed, and Congress is, is right now you know, finishing up a pretty big domestic manufacturing bill. Biden clearly feels like this is something his voters wanted and something they'll reward him for. The former might be true. All this stuff polls really, really well. But it sure doesn't look like he'll be getting credit for it in the midterms. Ultimately, though, the point of politics isn't to win elections or see your party do well and the other party do poorly. The point is to make people's lives better. And this bill will undoubtedly do that for millions of people. If it does get passed, it'll be important in the coming days and weeks ahead to think clearly about how this broken system was able to produce this result because it was never obvious that it would happen. And so yeah, I'm just kind of just curious about how on earth we have this kind of transformational presidential year going on right now, combined with no real movement to put Biden in office. You know, he had like seven, eight people showing up at his Iowa rallies. Half them would leave those rallies, having gone in a Biden supporter and having left unsure. And then he basically wins the presidential election from his Wilmington basement. Uh, his popularity is in the 30s. And he's about to pass this massively popular agenda, we think, we'll see, see if it happens, through Congress. So I, it, it's, uh, it's hard to make sense of what's going on. I mean, the Republicans don't really oppose it. They right. kind of say they oppose yes. it. Trump wants them to oppose it. But even he doesn't actually oppose it. He just opposes Democrats right. winning on something. Um, the, I mean, you're, I actually think a lot of the, your, the realignment analysis is, I agree with it. The, the political system has gotten in a way more efficient, more efficient for this in terms of the system, not for democracy right. or for good outcomes, but for, for like itself. everyone. It, it used to have very conservative Democrats, very liberal Republicans. It was not even clear what it meant to be a Republican. It was a kind of a, it was regional coalition, local issues. Yeah. It was just kind of a club you were a part of. Eventually, everyone sorted themselves into the correct identity given their actual ideological commitments and beliefs. So now there is no overlap. There, are, right. with rare exception, there is just everyone to the left is on one side, everyone to the right is the other, and uh, and but the Republicans in the last ten years have have gotten more interested in. Uh, cultural issues where they believe the American people and you know not and I don't think that's gay marriage and abortion that's cancel culture critical race theory mm -hmm. other things and uh, where they think the American people is more with them and they've they've done less fighting on uh, defighting sort of business uh, defending business interests and economic uh, honestly defending the things I believe right. uh, because they don't think there's you know it's it's the political alignment chart right, right. here's here's Robbie uh, here's Ryan over here, and like the American people are all mostly here, yeah. so the Republicans used to be like here, and they want to be more here because there's more people over here. Yeah, and what scrambles this, and I want to talk about this more in my in my next uh, radar, is is that 
Republicans in 2020 did better with working class voters, but not hugely better. I think something like they won about 54 percent of working class voters, non, what they call non-college. Right. And Democrats won like 46 percent. So you have everybody sorted, yet you have kind of a little more than half the working class in the Republican Party and a little less than half the working class in the Democratic Party, which means that if you want to, if, that if working class politics is the thing that you care about, then you don't really have a place to go, which, right. which is sort of the point, maybe, right. of the system. Right. But, but anyway, we'll get into more. And if foreign yeah. policy is the main thing you care about, you, yeah. <laughs> good luck. Good luck with that, yeah. Team Rising joins us next. Please stick around for that.